1981, Free Your Eyes only hit theaters. Unlike some of the previous films, this was more of an attempt to ground the series and take it away from the campy direction it had been heading towards throughout the 70s, exemplified, most notoriously, by Moonraker. The film was a worldwide success, and work quickly began on the next film, Octopussy. An aging Roger Moore, however, had decided that he'd had enough playing James Bond, and he actually retired from the role. So the search was on for a replacement. After testing several actors, including Lewis Collins, who was famous off The Professionals, the decision was made to go with none other than James Brolin. Yes, American James Brolin, father of Josh Brolin. Yes, he's an American, but he actually aced his screen test, which you can actually watch on the Octopussy DVD and Blu-ray. Also helping matters was the fact that Brolin was able to affect a certain mid-Atlantic accent, which made him somewhat easier to accept as a British agent. If you watch his screen test, it's actually not half bad. He nails the action scenes, nails the seduction scenes, and looks cool in a suit. He almost played James Bond. The contracts were about to be signed, but then some really, really, really big news broke. Sean Connery, the definitive James Bond, had been signed to star in Never Say Never Again, a rival Bond film produced through Warner Brothers, which was the result of a complicated legal battle between producer Kevin McClory and Cubby Broccoli. But of course, more on that in the next installment. Knowing that there was no way that James Brolin could compete with Sean Connery, Cubby Broccoli managed to convince Roger Moore to once again slip on his tux. In the film, which was co-written by George MacDonald Frazier, famous for the Flashman series, 007 investigates the murder of a British agent and stumbles upon a smuggling ring with ties to a renegade Russian general intent on starting nuclear war with the West. Now, people are going to give me a lot of grief for this particular installment of James Bond Revisited. For some reason, everybody remembers Octopussy as being one of the lesser James Bond movies, but in my opinion, they're wrong. You see, I love Octopussy. In fact, I'd wager it's probably one of my favorite James Bond movies of all time. Is it a good film? Critically, I can look at it and say, probably not. I mean, there's a lot of silliness in Octopussy. You know, James Bond dresses up as a clown. He infiltrates the circus. I'm deadly serious. I'm a British agent. What? He swings from rope to rope in the jungle with the Tarzan yell. He tells a tiger to sit. There's a lot of weird, weird, weird stuff in this movie. And it's juvenile, but I can't help but love this film. You see, it was the second James Bond film I ever saw on the ABC Saturday Night movie. And, well, I just watched it over and over again as a kid, and it's become this kind of elemental part of my DNA, I suppose. Octopussy is simply one of the transformative movies for me. I can really understand why some people hate this film, and it has inarguable flaws, but the film is just damn fun to watch. When For Your Eyes Only came out in 1981, it was a box office success, but in North America it wasn't anywhere near as big as Moonraker. It got its ass kicked by Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's obvious that the filmmakers behind this one, which include returning director John Glenn, must have studied that film before starting work on Octopussy, as they imbue this film with the same kind of pulpy cliffhanger energy that was really in every frame of Raiders of the Lost Ark and was pretty common in some of the Indiana Jones clones of the time. And of all the Bond films up to this point, I'd say that Octopussy probably has the most action. The film starts with a crazy mini jet chase and the pace never lets up for one second. Over the next two hours, we get a wild chase through a crowded Indian market featuring sword swallowers, fire breathers, jugglers, etc, etc, a tiger hunt with Bond as the bait, a crazy battle involving a buzzsaw yo-yo that I thought was the coolest thing ever when I was 10 years old, Bond fighting killers above and below a train, a car chase with Bond driving on the tracks, James Bond dressed as a clown, and finally a wild palace shootout where Bond fights alongside a legion of scantily clad women, with Q offering air support from a hot air balloon. I mean, I don't know about No Time to Die, but I don't think it'll be anywhere near as cool as Octopussy, right? I mean, Q in a hot air balloon? Come on, it's the greatest. So one of the things that people kind of attack this movie for is the script by George MacDonald Frazier, which I must admit is a bit silly, but I kind of like it. You see, in the early 80s, the West was in kind of Cold War hysteria. Reagan was president and, you know, nuclear war with Russia was a real threat. Movies like The Day After came out and scared the crap out of people. So it's not a surprise that this film in some ways does demonize Russia with Stephen Burkhoff, who always played these kind of villains in the 80s, 
playing the diabolical Russian general who wants to, you know, destroy the West. How he ends up getting involved with a circus run by Maude Adams Octopussy and Louis Jardin's Kamal Khan stretches things a little bit, but I think it's fun. As an excuse to frame action scenes, Octopussy kind of works. It's not one of the more serious Bond movies, in fact it's probably one of the silliest Bond movies, but I really like it and I like the screenplay. So I give it about a 7 on 10. It's fun. It's the kind of thing that would make for a good airport read. Now. As this is one of the more lighthearted James Bond movies, I have to say Roger Moore really fits into the part. Now, he's 56 at this point, which I think we'll all admit was a little bit over the hill. Roger Moore, God bless him, probably stuck around too long as James Bond, but it's not as bad here as it is in A View to a Kill two years later. He still looks reasonably fit, gets his shirt off, looks pretty good, and actually has really good chemistry with Maud Adams. She's only about 20 years younger than him, which in Bond Girl math is actually not too bad. Makes her an age-appropriate love interest, I guess, which is kind of strange. Also, Roger Moore seems to be having a good time with Desmond Llewellyn, who he kept pushing to get more screen time, so in this entry, Q has a fairly substantial role. Roger Moore looks like he's enjoying himself, and in his biography said that it was one of the most fun James Bond films to shoot, so that's cool. Roger Moore aces Bond in this one. Although that said, he's doubled a lot by his stuntman. Now, there are two significant villains in this movie. The first is Louis Jardin, who was actually a former song and dance man for MGM. Ever see Gigi? Yes, he's the heartthrob in Gigi. Jardin has one of the best voices in cinema history, this really cool kind of French accent, although I don't know why this makes him a guy who should play an Indian character. But hearing him say the name Octopussy, Octopussy, over and over again, kind of makes the film worth watching, right? Octopussy, Octopussy. The character is a little bland though. I think he's supposed to be an Afghani prince or something, but I don't know, it doesn't really make much sense. Steven Burkhoff, who as I mentioned was the quintessential 80s stock villain, pops up here and there as the Mad General Orloff and does indeed have threat. He has these crazy eyes and this mole in the middle of his head that you know really freaked me out as a kid. I thought it was like a third eye. And he's definitely menacing enough to be a credible secondary villain. I actually think of all the villains, probably Kabir Betty, who's a huge star in Bollywood, has the most memorable screen time as Kamal Khan's heavy. He looks really cool, and I like it when he crushes the dice in his hands. It's pretty neat. The villains, I would say, are probably about a 7 on 10. Bond Girl, however, one of my favorites. I'd give her a 10 on 10. Maude Adams is Octopussy, and this is actually her second go-round, having previously appeared as Scaramanga's doomed girlfriend in The Man with the Golden Gun. Maude Adams is great, looks good with Roger Moore, as she was, I guess, closer to his age than some other Bond girls of the era, but, you know, not really. She also gets in on the action and is kind of a fun character. I like Octopussy's backstory where her father was a British agent and wants to thank Bond for giving him the chance to, you know, do the honorable thing, you know, kill himself rather than go to jail. I like the relationship, I like her romance with Moore, and I think she's also pretty good in the action scene. She's a really good Bond girl. I'd give her a 10 on 10. The Bond music. This is where the movie really excels. John Barry is back after having taken off For Your Eyes Only and contributes one of his best scores. It sounds probably more like an Indiana Jones score than a James Bond score, but it's really good. I think it's one of his best. I've also always had kind of a soft spot for the theme song All Time High by Ray Coolidge, even though a lot of people kind of mock it as having that early 80s adult contemporary sound. Whatever, I like it. And you know what? It even got a shout out in Seth MacFarlane's TED. Due to the high action quotient, this film has a massive body count. All in all, James Bond takes out 78 baddies. 78, really? Wow, that seems like a lot for a James Bond movie. But anyway, well, what can you do? Roger Moore, however, was getting on in age, and at 56, I suppose it's understandable that the number of women Bond sleeps with in this film has reduced somewhat. He only sleeps with two women. What a shock. I should mention, though, one of the girls is Christina Wayborn, who's Octopussy's second in command, and she's gorgeous. And by the way, for Bond allies, keep an eye out for Vijay Armitrage, the famous tennis player, as his sidekick, Vijay, who, of course, is also a tennis player in the film and beats people up with his racket. It's pretty awesome. The gadgets in this movie are pretty cool. Q issues Bond a neat fountain pen, which consists of a vial of acid as opposed to ink, to which Bond naturally replies, wonderful for poison pen letters. There's some really good one-liners in this movie. There's a great scene where he's being pursued through the jungle by Kamal Khan and his men, and Bond manages to escape to a nearby river where he catches a ferry full of tourists. By this point, Bond's been pretty badly beat up and looks terrible after having been attacked by tarantulas, tigers, bats, etc. When one of the women asks James Bond if he's with their tour, he manages a classic, no ma'am, I'm with the economy group, while raising an eyebrow. Classic. 
There's also kind of a mean double entendre when James Bond goes to Q Branch and he sees this rope that kind of is mechanized, the Indian rope trick, you know, from movies where it's mechanized and it malfunctions. And then Bond says to Q, having trouble getting it up, Q? I mean, really, that's not very nice. Q's an older man. I mean, maybe he does have a little trouble. I don't know. I always thought this scene at the end where all the girls carry Q off in their arms was kind of strange because it looks like, I don't know, Q's heading towards a massive orgy. Strange. Oh, cut it out. We haven't time for that. Aww. Later, perhaps. So as far as James Bond movies go, it's hard for me to grade this one on 10. I know that people have taken issue with some of my grades in the past. Some have said that I was too hard on the movies. Some have said I wasn't hard enough. Octopussy is one that I think people will have a hard time reckoning my grade with. But I have to say, Octopussy is simply one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Critically, I'd probably give this like a 6 on 10, but you know, nostalgically, I have to give it a 10. What can I say? It's one of my favorite Bonds. I love it. Sue me. Now, despite the fact that everybody has always said that they prefer Sean Connery to Roger Moore, it's worth noting that Octopussy actually ended up outgrossing Never Say Never Again by over $20 million. You see, Octopussy was a huge hit in the summer of 1983, pulling in $57 million in North America, despite heavy competition from movies like Return of the Jedi, Trading Places, War Games, Blue Thunder, and Flashdance. Worldwide, it pulled in $187 million. So I guess I'm not the only one that likes Octopussy. Octopussy is a great James Bond movie. I kind of wish that they'd make another James Bond movie like this, one that's just fun. I'd love to see Daniel Craig crack a smile as James Bond. I feel like he never does. It's just a fun James Bond movie and one of the reasons I really loved the series as a kid. So sue me. But of course, 1983 was the year of the great James Bond face-off, and this story wouldn't be complete with going into Never Say Never Again. So join us next time on James Bond Revisited as we take a look at that often forgotten piece of James Bond lore, Never Say Never Again, a chapter in James Bond history that the producers don't like to talk about for obvious reasons, and we'll get all into it next time.